I'm here today with Reverend Michael Corrin. Michael's an Anglican priest, an author, and a columnist. He also hosted a nightly television and radio show for 20 years, for which he won numerous awards. His latest book is The Rebel Christ. He's a columnist for the Toronto Star and a frequent contributor to the Globe and Mail, Now Magazine, TV Ontario, McLean's, iPolitics, The New Statesman, and several other Canadian and British publications. He's also the best-selling author of 18 different books, including biographies of G.K. Chesterton, H.G. Wells, Arthur Conan Doyle, J.R.R. Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis. He's published in more than a dozen different languages, and you can learn more about Michael at Michael Corin, that's C-O-R-E-N, dot com. So, Michael, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, congratulations on all of your amazing work. Thank you. Well, it sounds more impressive when it's read out like that. I mean, you know... <laughs> I, the bet there were only only three or four of them were bestsellers, and um, one of them was a bestseller for one week. <laughs> but there was one book that was on there for quite some time. But Canadian bestsellers, you know, that's a, prov- a bit of a qualification there. Canadian bestsellers. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Canada matters. I mean, <laughs> it does. And the um, the foreign. I mean, I've had a few translations, but the big translation books. I don't want to sound uh, you know too modest, but uh, it was the C.S. Lewis and the J.R. Tolkien biographies, mm. and it was because of the movies. So it was a time when everyone was interested, in, and we were selling the book to publishers in Turkey, Greece, various Scandinavian countries, Japan. Um, doesn't happen anymore. Haven't had that in years. <laughs> well, uh, every author's dream is that their novel or book will be turned into a movie, right? <laughs> it's like... Yeah, I can't imagine that happening anymore for me, of, but... Uh, yeah, that was, um, it, it caught a wave, you know, I, I, when the uh, when the Tolkien, Amazon released their Tolkien uh, TV show, the most expensive in history, in September, I should think every publisher will be reissuing their biographies of Tolkien. <laughs> so, um, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about your background than what I briefly touched on. Could you go through that for the benefit of our listeners? Yeah, um, incredibly ordinary, rather banal. Uh, I was raised in um, in London, England, sort of East London, Essex area where they meet and uh, sort of upper working class family. My dad was a cab driver, taxi cab, those black cabs in London. Um, so, you know, earned fairly decent money for a working man, but he was still a working class fellow. Uh, my dad was from a Jewish family and uh, actually three of my grandparents were Jewish, but not my mum's mum. So that's what sort of qualifies you well today it's far more liberal shall we say but certainly back then it had to be through the maternal line um went to university i mean i, I i'm 63 I, I was born in 59 I, I grew up with a a wonderfully generous social democratic britain god bless social democracy and um so i had all of my university paid for went to good universities in britain everything paid for and it was marvelous uh, became a journalist I uh, had no religion, no, uh, my family were very, very, very secular, quite, quite anti-religion, anti-organized religion, actually, all organized religion. And um, after a couple of universities, I was a journalist living in the center of London. I, I felt a pull towards Christianity various times in my life, even fairly young. And um, I became a Roman Catholic in, I think it was 84, in the middle of London, beautiful, lovely church in the middle of London. And um, had a few books published, and I was doing quite well. Came to Canada in 1986 to, to give a paper at a literary conference on G.K. Chesterton, about whom I'd written a biography. And I gave—I was—I was probably the youngest one there by about a generation. I had a big uh, conference, a lot of people, vast. And I—I um, I gave my my paper, and at the uh, the party, big cocktail party at the end of it, this rather beautiful young woman came up to me, possibly drunk, I don't know. And she said, you're amazing. And thinking this may never happen again, I married her. And uh, <laughs> I was quite right. It hasn't happened again. <laughs> uh, but that's why I, I came to Canada. And, and I've lived here ever since, 34, 35 years. Um, we have four children. Just had our first grandchild. And uh, I became a sort of, I don't know, a, a, a very minor public figure, 
sort of fairly well known in southern Ontario, which is a great deal, doesn't it? It would be on my tombstone. He was fairly well known <laughs> in parts of southern Ontario. Uh, and uh, I suppose I, 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 I became very much a, a defender of, of, of orthodox Catholicism. Uh, and, the, and in the public sphere, that often led itself into to opposing equal marriage, uh, opposing women's choice. Now, I don't think I did it in a, in a, in a, a vicious way. I did it in a fairly intelligent way. But even so, that teaching I find now to be very difficult and very painful. And for years, I did that. And I was sort of, a, you know, the, the, the go-to guy in this country, in Canada, for conservative Catholicism. I wrote a book called Why Catholics Are Right. Yes, yes. Which sold, oh, if I could, if I could sell that many copies now. Oh, <laughs> I think we sold about more than 40,000, which is a lot of books. And I, I was going on EWTN in the States with uh, Raymond Arroyo. I mean, now I see Raymond all over Fox News. Oh, Raymond, how could you? Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, and then about eight years ago, I, I had this conversion and uh, an epiphany. I don't know. I just, the, I re, the, the wedge issue was, was gay equality. I could no longer, I could no longer say the things or believe the things that the Catholic Church taught. You know, I know the Catholic Church well. I know there are many, look, I know how many clergy are gay, for goodness sake. But I also I know how many progressive Catholics there are. But the teaching of the church is draconian, mm -hmm. and severe, and it's fierce on these issues. And um, I had, I, I don't know, something like a, a spiritual breakdown, perhaps, but I found that I simply could not continue with those beliefs. And I had enough respect for the Catholic Church that I couldn't stay in that church and not believe these things. And I gradually slid over, found the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church, as it were, which, funnily enough, growing up in England, you'd think I would know all about the Church of England, but <laughs> it was it was the wallpaper, it was the background noise. So I hadn't paid much attention to it. And I came across this institution where I could be the Catholic I wanted to be. I could be this progressive Catholic. I, I could still believe in some of the sacraments, but um, and uh, it was a very painful time. You know, there was a lot of anger thrown at me, a lot of disappointment, a lot of firings. There's none so angry as a fundamentalist scorned. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, it was a different, I mean, on a, on a personal level, emotional level, but it seems like another lifetime. And uh, became an Anglican. It was all very public. I didn't want it to be, but it became very public out uh, here. And um, after a couple of years, people kept saying to me, you, have you ever considered being ordained? At which point I would laugh very loudly. <laughs> um, they kept on and again other things and I and how old was I 55 mid 50s I went back to university <laughs> never dreamt I'd do that and I I did um, a master's of divinity in three years which was really pushing it because normally it takes longer than that but I got it and um, I was ordained a deacon uh, about two and a half years ago and I ordained a priest last uh, September so I'm, I, they, they call it bivocational, which sounded much more sexy to me when they told me. <laughs> <But> it's not. <laughs> but I'm, I still write. I don't do much TV or radio anymore, hardly any. Uh, but I, I write um, in Canada and the UK quite a bit, a column or two a week, and some books. And I'm a, and I'm a priest, only part-time, two or three days a week. Uh, so that's what I am now. I'm a priest, father, grandfather, and columnist. And I've never <laughs> been a back then. It's amazing. It's I mean, I think your, your saga and your journey is really amazing. I mean, there are some parallels uh, to people that maybe grew up in a fundamental evangelical type of, you know, background and basically, I'll use the word converted out of that, you know, into something a little bit more progressive. Do you run into people where you see those kinds of similarities? I, I do. I mean, it's a very, it's a very interesting question you've asked there, because it, it's a bit of a... Um, uh, of an issue for me because what I find particularly in the American experience is a lot of people who come out of the evangelical world but that's all they've known they've been raised in an evangelical family I was raised in a secular half Jewish East London family so we spent most of our time shouting <laughs> uh, anyone who comes from a Jewish or Italian background will identify what I'm saying you know if we felt it we said it uh, we told each other we loved each other all the time 
uh, we're very open. It was very lovely in that. Not perfect, but very lovely in many ways. But I do come across a lot of people who've been raised from, from, from birth into an evangelical family in the U.S. That's very American. I mean, we have it in Canada, and we have it to a certain degree in the U.K., but not <clears throat> in the U.S. And they discover a much more, it can sound quite pejorative, but a much more loving, compassionate Jesus later on, and they want to write about it. And I do have some concerns about that because that is not most of the world. We shouldn't be coming from that position and then saying, no, that's not what it is. It, it, it's, it locks us into a certain view. Um, but I've come across a number of people like that, certainly. Far fewer who come from conservative Catholicism, they tend to stay in the Catholic Church and, and, and just move within it, or they leave completely. Mm. It's, it, it's quite noticeable. We do get people in the Anglican communion who come from Roman Catholicism that tends to be more after a divorce mm. or someone in the family is gay okay. and they find much greater acceptance. But um, sorry, I'm moving my laptop screen. I'm probably ruining your... No, it's uh, fine. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do come... I mean, there's a lot of books written by people who have come out of, yes, of that. Yes, yes. Um, but they're often quite personal. You know, my journey is... And it's interesting, but, I, um, you know, I, I write, let me think, I, I write a column for my uh, diocese newspaper, diocese newspaper. But other than that, I don't write much for the, I mean, I, Christian media. Um, the, there's no, we have very little of it in Canada and there's nobody I write for. I write for major secular newspapers. I, I'm writing for the world, I suppose. And I'm a little bit careful about, try only writing for, for Christians. I just think that that can be very limiting. You know, we really have to reach, we're almost like um, uh, a pre-Christian stage now. I mean, people of my age assumed that if we mentioned something in scripture that was famous, it will be known by those around us. That's all gone. We now have a new generation where they, the playing field is completely level. And I welcome that. So we really have to present Christian arguments uh, from a completely neutral point of view and then see what happens. So, um, sorry, I've, I mean, I've taken a long time to answer your question. I do indeed meet people uh, from evangelical backgrounds who, um, and indeed there are some wonderful evangelical churches that have been set up uh, in Canada. I can speak with some authority, not the US. I'm sure they're, they're, there, they're there, but they're, they're almost post-evangelical. Mm -hmm. So they've come from Pentecostal and reformed backgrounds we have a sizable reform church here, big Dutch immigration because it was Canadian troops that liberated a lot of Holland in the Second War. Uh, and um, so they, they've, they've held on to the, those, some of that theology, but they, it has to be expressed in a different way, in a much more progressive way. So these mega churches have come, and, and, and often they're wonderful. Not my theology, but they're much more progressive than what they, they used to be. And there's a lot of, so very exciting in many ways. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. So. Let's talk about your books. I mean, you've written mm. some diverse types of books. You know, you mentioned earlier all the biographies, you know, famous folks, you know, some religious, some not. Um, and then the rebel Christ, right? I mean, it's completely different than that. And, mm. and you've written other genre as well. So can you talk a little bit about your kind of progression, so to speak, in terms of the different types of books you've written? Well, I, my first two books were a long time ago. I was 24 years old and uh, they're both, uh, pretty awful actually <laughs> one of them was um a television series i was very lucky i was researcher for quite a well-known journalist in the in the uk called john pilger a man very much of the left an australian actually and we did a tv show called the outsiders and we interviewed some of them aren't well known some of them uh, are quite well known uh, jessica mitford um salman rushdie martha gilhorn uh, Costa Gavras, the, the movie director, um, various people, and I wrote a book of the series, but it was mainly really just transcripts and, and short biographies, and then a book about a theatre that was offered to me, and um, and then I, I wrote a biography of G.K. Chesterton, that was the one that brought me to Canada. So I wrote a few, I, I, I gained a reputation as a literary biographer, but not of the first order. There were some marvelous people like Michael Holroyd and Peter Ackroyd and I wasn't in that league but then I 
other books began to, to come along and uh, wrote a couple of books about Catholicism uh, and, um, and some collections of columns and things. The Lewis and the Tolkien biographies are young adult biographies. They're only about 25,000 words, but actually I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of those two books. I think they really do, I think they're pretty good. And, and I'm honest, because some of the books I've written, I wouldn't particularly recommend them to anyone. But The Rebel Christ, um, I wasn't gonna, I, di I didn't think I had another book in me at this point. Mm. I've been asked to write a memoir in Canada, maybe one day, uh, but a publisher approached me to write a book about progressive Christianity. Um, and uh, and when they said 50,000 words, that was music to my ears, because that's not very long. And I, I thought that I, I do not want to write a 100,000 word book at this point. <laughs> and um, so I did, and I, and I found it, uh, I, I have a, my, the way I write a book, I've always done it like this. I, I will, alarm went off at five o'clock every morning. I would do the morning office of Anglican prayers, uh, make my coffee by six o'clock, I'd be at my desk and I, I'd write till 11 or midday. Um, I don't know actually, so that's the way I have to write a book. I can't do it any other way. But it was a very, it was quite a wonderful experience really. And, and um, you know, you, you've read the book. It's not, a, it's not apologetics. I'm not making the case for Christianity. I'm really just reacting to the Christian right and explaining what scripture says about some major issues. So there's a, there's a chapter on homosexuality, equal marriage, uh, gay equality, chapter on abortion um, and so on, another chapter on economic justice and, and lots of other issues thrown in. So I, I mean, I have to say of all, all the books I've written, I, I'm immensely proud of this one. And there's lots of personal stories too. I try to break up the narrative with personal stories that I hope sometimes can be quite moving um, to just, to, to present um, who I think is the, the real Jesus, a, a figure of, I wrote a column for the, the Globe and Mail, which is like our, our New York Times up here uh, this week. It was about the, um, the protests that are taking place. And I used a phrase, and sometimes I'll use a phrase and think, you know what, I like that, I like that. And I said, what was it? Jesus who could be as gentle as, gentle as a watercolor in his compassion but as fierce as a Judah of, as a lion of Judah in his demand for social justice. Yeah, as gentle as a watercolor in his compassion, but as fierce as a lion of Judah in his call for social justice. And that's my Jesus. And I try to present that in the book. And, and um, you know, it's the best I can do. If I didn't get it right, well, that's me done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like you said, I mean, it's your view of Jesus, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a very personal thing. And it, as you said, it involves a lot of your personal story, you know, intertwined in it. So, you know. But, but a lot of, of, of uh, scriptural text as well. I mean, I, I try to back everything up. I'm not a scholar, but I'm no fool. I've done a lot of <laughs> studying. And um, uh, so I really, and, and I had it read by some some. Impressive. I mean, uh, Mark Oakley, who's the Dean of uh, uh, St. John's College, Cambridge, he read it for me and he is the real thing. And uh, uh, Sir Dermot McCulloch, Professor of Church History at Oxford um, and others. So, you know, I put it in their hands. So, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a priest. I'm not a scholar. I'm not an intellectual, but I, I'm not a fool either. And I, I, I like to think it does present the arguments. Look, there are a lot of books of theology. There are probably too many books of theology <laughs> and I was looking for a, a mass audience and you know we we, we did didn't nothing in the states but up here in Canada we sold lots of copies and in the UK we did pretty well too um, but in the US it's very hard to break through and I don't know anyone yeah um, why do you suppose that that's the case you know I mean well you're, you're, a, you're a bunch of foreigners what do I know I <laughs> <laughs> you think uh, it was I, the, uh, the uh, publishing house does that drive that distribution or? Yeah, well, to a degree, I mean, uh, this was a fairly small, a Dundon. I, I, I used to be with Random House, but even then, even with a big publisher like Random House, it doesn't guarantee anything. I think there's a bit of fatigue. Um, I, I think, you know, I thought to myself, I don't watch that much TV anymore, but I, I'll look at CNN and uh, cringe a little bit and, and other stations. You know, why isn't there someone there 
you know, don't get Father James Martin on again. And he's very good and all that, but he's so tied into what he can really say. Yes, uh, yes. And you think, go on, you. I know you think that. Say it, say it. But I, I mean, I admire him very much. But there's a lot more that, that can be said. And uh, I was hoping there would be some sort of interview on a, a large uh, American TV station or something on the left. Or, but no, I mean, we, but I didn't have the contacts there. And I, but I do think there's a bit of Jesus fatigue. Hmm. And I've heard this from other people that, uh, especially the Rebel Christ, and I'm unknown in the U.S. You know, I'm known in Canada. I'm really right, quite, right. You know, and I have a lot of friends in the UK and I write for the New States, which is a big magazine. Um, but uh, no, so in the US, we, I mean, I, I did, didn't have a publicist and I tried a few friends and I didn't get much of a response. So if anyone is interested, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to read a couple of the blurbs, you know, endorsements that people have written yeah. about the book. Um, this one's from Stephen Fry. Ah. He says, integrity, wit and passion, a fine advocate for the best of Christian thought and a faith that encompasses the human as well as the divine. And then this one is from the Cherry Report. Michael Corrin's book, The Rebel Christ, is an inspired pleasure to read. Its clear and well-paced arguments reveal a refreshingly fierce optimism and an indig indignation that springs from Corrin's passion for Christianity's potential. So those are obviously very nice you know, uh, comments about the book, and I think they're well-deserved. Uh, I'm curious as to why you think um, they mentioned a fierce optimism and an indignation. <laughs> well, I think there is some indignation. I mean, it, it's hard not to be, to see the faith which informs everything. Well, I, I try to make it inform everything I do. I think twisted, distorted, perverted by Donald Trump some of his followers. I, I'm not talking here about more con conservative evangelicals who differ on me theologically. Okay, that's fair enough. I'm talking about people who, who scream, who roar hatred of those of a different race, who want to prevent anyone crossing a border because it might, I mean, I, I don't have to repeat to you, I don't have to reiterate what, what has gone on in, in the US and how Christianity ha has been weaponized and radicalized by yes, people absolutely. who have nothing in common with Jesus. Um, as for the Stephen Fry quote, you know, hey, you get Stephen drunk, he'll say anything. No, no, <laughs> no. that's not true. That's not true. He's just um, one of the most gracious people I know. And Stephen is a very well-known atheist, obviously. And But the point about Stephen, um, he is, he's not, I think he sometimes has seemed angry because especially as a gay man, how much homophobia is he going to take and listen to before he reacts in a certain way? But he's not angry. He has a great love, really, for much of Christianity, the Church of England and so on. Um, and when I was ordained, he was one of the first people to email me. And I mean, he's a lovely person and very supportive of me and what, and what I've done and, and, and who I am. Uh, but we disagree. But he was talking about, I suppose, the best of Christianity. So it, it was a very kind and very generous blurb. Uh, but indignation, it's interesting you picked that out. I think it's a, it's a valid point. Um, there is such a thing as righteous anger. And I, I try very hard to be forgiving. And I think I, I, I don't do too badly because there are some very, very vicious attacks on me on social media, on my Twitter account in particular. Um, but, but, but it is so hurtful to see how Christianity is twisted by the right. Yeah, I couldn't agree and, with you more. You know, and, and I think, you know, some anger is quite justified. <laughs> I think so. It's not just what they're doing is so dishonest and so wrong. It also so tarnishes Christianity. Mm -hmm. Why would any person look to Christianity and be interested when they see these, these fanatics, these machinists, <laughs> you know, screaming anger and hatred and, and literalist twisting and not having any understanding of what scripture is really meant to I mean, look i think i say this in the book the bible's central to my life but it, and it's the inspired word of god but it's not divine dictation we're not meant to live every word as literal truth and this we, we have to understand what it means the hebrew scriptures are written for an ancient people it's an ancient text and you cannot apply that it, it implodes you can't imply it to everyday situations 
And if you do that completely, then of course you'll be selling your child, in, your daughter into slavery. Of course not. And if you really understand what things mean, it, it comes to life. And even the New Testament, you know, that the letters of Paul, my Greek is not very good and I have to work very hard at my Hebrew is much better. But if you really understand what Paul is saying, it's not what, the, what we're told by the Christian right. And I'm not picking one side here, um, but it is the right that have done so much damage. And as I say in the book, it's relatively recent. It's from the 1960s. You know, the evangelical world didn't particularly oppose abortion. Uh, I think I quoted in the book, I can't remember, I think I do, the, the uh, Southern Baptists said abortion at various stages should be allowed and for various reasons. Right. They became radicalized much later on, on that issue. Right. And, um, and I think a lot of it comes out of the, the civil rights movement, which they often opposed, and also the so-called permissive society, which terrified them and it pushed them into this, this corner. And, uh, and on so many issues too. I mean, I, I, I care passionately about peace in the Middle East. It's something I've been involved with for quite some time. And the, this eschatology they have, they, they call themselves supporters of Israel and Zionists. They're not supporters of Israel. They're supporters of an end times theory that will lead to the deaths of, of most Jews and, and virtually all Arabs. And, and, and it's a misreading of scripture that, <laughs> So there's so much pain that's being caused and I have so many friends in the gay Christian world, the agony they've gone through and, and they've, they've, they have this alternative set of sacraments now. You, you, you can believe in every word of the creed, but if you, if you do not toe the line exactly on abortion and equal marriage, you're a heretic. Mm. And that is disgraceful, mm -hmm. particularly as the Bible I mean, most of us would want abortion rates to fall. I, I know I say this in the book. Of course we would. So if we have good sex ed in every school, contraceptives freely available, um, socialized medicine in your country, uh, eradicate poverty, empower women, um, enforce paternity payments, uh, all this sort of thing, abortion rates will plummet. But there's very people who want to take, a, take away women's choice oppose almost all of those policies. Exactly. They are not pro-life. They're not even pro-birth uh, because they don't really care about the, 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 the woman, the pregnant woman, particularly if she's poor or racialized. They, they just, it, it's about control. It's about control and uh, abortion is a sensitive issue that should be discussed with, with understanding and, and love and, and they just shout and shoot. So um, on to a couple of other, you know, topics, a little, a little more um, light maybe. Um, what are you reading right now? What are you finding to be very interesting um, in what you're reading? Well, I am reading right now. I'm just leaning over to get the, <laughs> it's not a theology. It's Richard Osman's second book, uh, The Man Who Died Twice. Richard Osman is a, uh, a TV celebrity in the UK, a very bright guy. And he, he wrote a thriller, which I enjoyed. And he's written a second one, and I'm just reading it now. It's, um, and, it, and it's perfect in that it's set in an old people's home. <laughs> and apparently, Steven Spielberg has already bought the rights to the first one. Wow. And you can, um, you can just see who it's going to be. You know, Helen Mirren and Ben Kingsley and Ian McKellen and, and Patrick Stewart, all these older actors. But, and I heard him being interviewed and he, and he said, what fascinates him is, and I do a lot of work in retirement centers as a, as a priest. You think you know who these people are. Remember, they were young during the swing sixties. You know, they, 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 were, they, were, they were doing drugs and having sex and all this sort of thing. And now they're in these retirement homes. So they're very <laughs> interesting people. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that, it's, um, yeah. so I'm reading, uh, what else am I reading right now? I'm rereading this, actually. Angela Tilby's um, Won't You Join the Dance. I'm glad I had all my books by my tip, which is a book I, I read a long time ago. Um, it's really just a monograph, and it's very, it's about the creed, and uh, enjoying it very much. Um, what else am I reading? I think that's about it. Um, I mean, I re read a lot of history, sort of ongoing um also mainly uh, european i'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to the reformation hmm. so 
often reading books uh, about the Reformation. I think that's watching too much TV. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. So what about your own writing? You mentioned a minute ago that, you know, you didn't really expect to write this book. You think there's any chances for future books? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there will be. And I, I think my publisher would like me to think of it, to write a memoir. And the only problem there, I think it, well, partly is I don't want to hurt people, but if I'm going to be honest about things that have happened in my life, I mean, that my life hasn't been without interest. I've met quite a lot of famous people uh, and worked with them. Um, I don't think it would have that much interest outside of Canada, maybe a bit in the UK, I don't know. Uh, but there's also the, the legal, I don't know how the legalities work. If you, mm. this company, you know, when, when I had this change of heart eight years ago, I was fired by all sorts of people. There are things I have said. I mean, there, there, there was one TV show that fired me, um, even though I had a list of, of shows all lined up to host because of my views on gay marriage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, but I might write that. I mean, I, I don't have another Christian book. In me. And, and Random House, who I used to be with, that they wanted another biography, but it's a, it's a lot of work to write a biography. And there's no one really, I, I think, um, I would like to write a biography of. So, um, but yeah, so what, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always writing a book and I write a number of columns. Um, what were well, one or two a week, not that many. So that keeps me fairly busy. Well, Michael, congratulations on The Rebel Christ. It's a wonderful book. I'm really glad it, you were referred to me. I'm glad the book was referred to me. Um, if people want to find out more, they can go to michaelcoren.com, C-O-R-E-N. So, Michael, yeah. thanks so much for joining us. And on Twitter, which I'm very active on, too active, I think it's at Michael Corrin. Okay, wonderful. Well, Michael, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you.